Hello and welcome to Kingston Now. I'm Jimmy Buff. Riverkeeper is a member-supported watchdog organization dedicated to defending the Hudson River and its tributaries. And here to tell us more about its origins and what it's doing currently is Philip Musagis, the Hudson River Program Director for Riverkeeper and the aptly named Kate Hudson, the Watershed Program Director. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Tell me about the origins of Riverkeeper. Where, how did it start? Sure. Well, we, uh, we actually started in 1966 as uh, an organization called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. And we were started by a small group of commercial fishermen on the Hudson River, uh, living around Croton on Hudson and uh, around Haverstraw Bay. And they were shad fishermen, striped bass fishermen, people that used to fish for sturgeon before that was outlawed. And um, they were very concerned and got together because they saw the um, oil pollution in the river. They saw the impacts the power plants were having on fish populations the general electric pollution of the PCBs into the Hudson, and it was affecting their livelihoods. The, the amount of fish was going down in the river, the fish were becoming contaminated, and they became very concerned and formed this fishermen's group and started trying to figure out ways that they could lobby the state government, the federal government, to protect the river more carefully. And um, eventually they were joined by a gentleman named Bob Boyle, who was a, uh, a sports writer for Sports Illustrated, actually wrote about fishing and Bob had a wonderful idea about using a very old navigation law called the Rivers and Harbors Act to actually help fund their activities. And essentially, the Rivers and Harbors Act is a law that predates the Clean Water Act, and it provides a financial bounty for anyone in the public that reports a polluter. And under this, under this very old law, uh, it was illegal to pollute, to dump pollution into the Hudson River, into New York Harbor, and uh, these, these commercial waterways. And so uh, our first cases against polluters, uh, we had cases against ExxonMobil and cases against um, some of the power plants on the river, um, were based on, on this law. And so we, if we reported pollution and this, the uh, federal government went after them and collected a reward, collected a penalty, we got half that penalty. And so <laughs> we, um, you know, and, and, and Bob Boyle coming in uh, was very auspicious because uh, by the time he came into the picture, the fishermen were very agitated and they were running out of options. They didn't know how to use the law and they were, you know, they were thinking of doing direct actions of, uh, you know, blockading the in front of the power plants and, you know, they were, they were at the end of the rope. And so, um, you know, that kind of started us on this course that we're on now of, of using the law, especially federal laws, to, um, to enforce the environmental laws that we have on the books. And, and the Clean Water Act is the law that we use the most now, which per is intended to protect the Hudson River and all of our major waterways from pollution. So we, we started that way in 1982, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and John Cronin, who people might have heard those names before in the, in the Hudson Valley, they, um, they joined the organization and they kind of changed it into what is now Hudson River Keeper. It's really interesting. It's like you started as a cow path, but now you're a six lane highway for what you do, the That's topics we want to cover today, uh -huh. you are so wide and varied beyond just what your origins mm -hmm. are. And in fact, I'd love for each of you to tell me what your specific titles relate to. So Kate, can you tell me what the watershed? Uh, Program director. Yeah. And the watershed in this case is the New York City drinking watershed. Uh, although the issue of hydrofracking, which has been a chief focus of the watershed program at Riverkeeper since, I want to say 2008, uh, has really, uh, moved our scope beyond just the New York City watershed because many of the challenges that hydrofracking and threats that hydrofracking poses to the New York City watershed, it poses to other drinking water supplies in the state of New York, and we are advocating on behalf of all of those. But generally speaking, it is the watershed, and before hydrofracking, there was a world before hydrofracking, we were very focused on um, uh, curbing development in watershed areas because of the impacts that it would have on tributaries and therefore on the quality of water in the watershed. Uh, we've also been very focused on the uh, interactions between New York City Department of Environmental Protection, who is responsible for managing the watershed, and watershed communities. And we are, a Riverkeeper is a signator on the 1997 Memorandum of Agreement, uh, which is the landmark watershed agreement that established uh, significant obligations on the part of the city towards the communities in the, in the watershed. And we are very much involved in making sure that DEP is living up to those obligations and commitments. And Philip, what does the Hudson River Program Director do? 
Well, I do um, what the title suggests. I manage all of our uh, legal work and policy work that has to do with protecting the Hudson River from pollution. And uh, so I'm an attorney. We have about uh, four other attorneys in my program that have active litigation cases, uh, everything from Indian Point to uh, working on the Tappan Zee Bridge to working on legislation at the state level. And so um, uh, we also have a parallel program, which is our boat program. Riverkeeper has a 37-foot uh, boat that's out on the Hudson River patrolling from Albany all the way down to the Battery in New York City. We patrol on the river about eight months a year, nine months a year. And uh, so we have a fully uh, devoted team on the boat. We have, a, we have a boat captain and we have a communications person and an assistant for that. So I work very closely with the boat pr program and then, of course, work closely with Kate. Yeah, I've had a chance to interview John Lipscomb, uh -huh. uh, who is the captain of the boat. Mm -hmm. And he is, uh, he's a seaman. He definitely is. He is a seaman. And I hope that. he kept his language clean on, the, on <laughs> your show. He does not pull any punches. <laughs> right. But, you know, he's the kind of guy you want on the river patrolling up he and is. down. It doesn't seem like anything's going to miss his, his vantage point from the crow's nest or wherever he is standing on the boat. It, it absolutely doesn't. He's, a, he's an amazingly passionate advocate for us, and he's, he's really our best representative out in the public, um, on the, both on the river patrolling and keeping a watchdog eye out, and also just um, communicating with the public. And uh, John is... Uh, is really our, our, uh, the pioneer of our water sampling program, uh, which looks at uh, water quality from in, in the entire Hudson Estuary. We sample for sewage pollution in the river, and uh, he pioneered that. He has a mini laboratory on the boat that actually tests for sewage contamination. So he's, uh, he's an amazing resource for us and, and really our, one of our best assets. You know, we can have all the lawyers in the world, but it, unless you have someone out in public and on the river really in the field doing the work, then, you know, you, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have that. He is advancing one of our local, locally significant programs, um, organizing community members to do uh, community member testing of local water bodies, including mm -hmm. the Roundout and the Esopus. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me more about that. The Esopus has been going on for a year or more, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and there, we're just trying to start up a Roundout testing program, mm -hmm. and I don't know whether you can add to that. Sure. We, um, well, we started this program on our, from our boat about four years ago where we have about 75 sample sites in the Hudson River. Where we, so we literally have a plastic bottle. We dip the bottle in the river and take samples. And uh, we, we look for sewage contamination. And so we're trying to replicate that by getting local communities, teaching them how to do that, get the samples analyzed, and then we're, we're kind of publicizing that data. Terrific. Much more ground to cover. We'll do that in just a moment. Thanks. You're watching Kingston Now and more with Riverkeeper when we come back. Welcome back to Kingston Now. Joining us once again is Philip Misegas and Kate Hudson of Riverkeeper. Now, Riverkeeper's headquarters are in Austin. Did you take the boat up the river to Kingston today? or <laughs> I wish I had. It's a beautiful day, but I, um, I took the thruway instead. All right. But we do have a satellite office of Riverkeeper here in Kingston in the Maritime Museum, Kate? That's correct. Uh, we uh, negotiated a, a really nice arrangement with the Maritime Museum, which is a wonderful organization, and I encourage everybody to go visit the museum. Uh, uh, about a year ago, and we now uh, have a presence there. I am there uh, one day a week on Fridays, and we also have Dan Shapley, who is uh, a development and media person who used to work for the Poughkeepsie Journal, uh, is there on Wednesdays. And so we welcome people coming to visit us there, and we are very happy to have that local connection given that we have a lot of issues that we deal with uh, in this part of the world. Um, Including, as we mentioned in the first segment, fracking. And if I, if I want to get some steam rising from your ears, <laughs> <laughs> I can say, have at it. <laughs> what is, um, there's so much made about fracking. You know, in fact, I was a little surprised to hear you ma mention that it started for you guys back in 2008, because to a lot of people, it's an issue that's appeared like in the last year. Uh, and so can you talk about what hydrofracking is and what it would do to the area and what Riverkeep, uh, Riverkeeper would like to see happen with fracking? Well, high volume hydrofracking is a new uh, technology for accessing natural gas in shale deposits uh, that are about 5,000 feet below the surface of the ground. 
Uh, and we, uh, unfortunately, along with Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, and one or two other states sit on top of uh, the Marcellus Shale, which is one of the biggest shale gas deposits in the world. And when this technology uh, was introduced, uh, there has ensued what I would describe to be a gold rush or uh, turn of the century Texas oil rush that has occurred. And uh, as a result, there has been hydrofracking in Pennsylvania uh, that has caused a number of environmental and human health problems because the activity got started before the regulations to protect the environment and human health were in place. Just very briefly, what is involved is uh, a vertical well bore is drilled and then it is horizontally, it's, it's moved horizontally for several thousand feet under the ground and then millions of gallons of water, fresh water, and chemicals and sand are forced into the horizontal well bore under pressure to shatter the shale gas, uh, the shale and release the gas. And the number of environmental problems that could be associated with that in terms of impacts on drinking water, impacts on landscape, impacts on employment and economics is just endless human health. Uh, what Riverkeeper has been involved in doing, in 2008, we established what we called the Industrial Gas Reporter. And essentially what we were doing was accumulating information about hydrofracking from other states where it was actually going on. Uh, the information about impacts to water, impacts to human health, and putting it in a online uh, uh, post so that people around here could begin to understand what was involved with hydrofracking. Uh, we moved on from there to publish Fractured Communities, which was a, a compilation of all those stories. We continue to have a Facebook presence, Don't Frack with New York, and we now have 9,000 Facebook followers uh, associated with the issue. And in the last year, we have been doing everything from testifying in front of the state legislature, the New York City Council. We submitted over 600 pages of comments on DEC's fracking plan. Um, we are now very focused on working with the legislature, who is uh, in the process of considering fracking-related legislation including requiring a health impact assessment, which is something that was just proposed by the assembly on Monday. Yeah, the, the issue is that, um, or part of the issue is that uh, there's just a moratorium right now. And there's, you know, so people took a little deep breath, but it's not out of the game whatsoever, is it? In fact, what we understand from speaking to officials at DEC, they received 65,000 comments on their environmental impact statement. The most comments they'd ever received on any other project was 1,000 to 1,300, just to put that in perspective. So they have to prepare a response to all of those comments before they can finalize their environmental review. They are saying that they're going to have their environmental review finalized by the end of this spring. Once that's finalized, in theory, the moratorium is, is lifted because the moratorium was to stay in place until they finished their environmental review. So we are quite concerned that they would be in a position to start issuing permits. Uh, I know that another legislative action uh, in the last week is that uh, an assembly member, I mean a Senate, a member of the Senate, has proposed a five-year moratorium, which I love the title of this uh, legislation. It's the Don't Look Before You Leap Act. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it is because once that environmental review is complete, this could move forward in New York. And we're talking about the Catskills. We're talking about the Southern Tier. Um, so this is counties in this area. And there are places in New York that have been already adversely affected by fracking. The interesting thing is that there actually have been streams in New York that were impacted by activities that companies were conducting fracking activities in Pennsylvania. And DEC has brought enforcement action against those companies. Um, there has not been any high volume hydrofracking in New York, but there has been vertical fracking that's been going on in New York. And one of the concerns that we have is that the wastewater uh, from the fracking activities is very saline. 
It's flowback water. Uh, it has been spread on the roads as a uh, ice and dust suppressant. <laughs> <laughs> One of the real challenges, too, with fracking is that no, no company is compelled to tell you what's in fracking fluid. They, it's guarded as a business secret, which is just extraordinary, you know. Um, and someday someone's going to get the Rosetta Stone of fracking fluid, and everyone's going to go, oh, that's what's in there? <laughs> that's what you put on the roads? <laughs> we're going to take another break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about uh, the state of the Hudson River and find out just how our water is doing. This is Kingston Now. We'll wrap up with Riverkeeper in a moment. Stay with us. You're watching Kingston Now, and we're talking with Philip Misegas and Kate Hudson of Riverkeeper. Philip, what is the condition of the Hudson River? Give us a state of the Hudson, if you will. Well, the river's much better than it used to be. We've had an incredible progress since the passage of the Clean Water Act 40 years ago. And so, in general, the, the water quality in the river itself is much, much better than it used to be. It's um, People are now swimming and kayaking and uh, really going on the river and being in the river much, much more than they used to be, including people around New York City. We, um, we do a lot of work in New York on um, industrial pollution and oil pollution sites. And it's amazing that, that the amount of interest that New Yorkers have, especially in Brooklyn and Queens and some of these uh, outer boroughs, in getting out on these waterways on the East River, on Newtown Creek, and around the harbor. So uh, in general, it's good. We've, we're doing this uh, water quality sampling program, which I mentioned before, that looks for sewage contamination. And uh, we focused on that in the last few years because this continuing problem with uh, outdated sewage infrastructure, so sewage treatment plants that can't handle the capacity, uh, combined sewer systems that end up uh, discharging a lot of untreated sewage into the river and into the harbor when it rains. Um, that's really our last kind of ongoing pollution problem in the river. You know, we have old polluted sites to deal with, like uh, the ExxonMobil oil spill site in Brooklyn. We have sites up and down the Hudson where you know, old industries used to be and they haven't been fully cleaned up. So we're always going to have that kind of work for the next, you know, 10, 20 years. But uh, if we can crack this nut of, of addressing the sewage pollution, we can really get on the road to having a fishable and swimmable Hudson River. And that's what the Clean Water Act envisioned. Speaking of fishable, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about a month and a half ago, the Atlantic sturgeon was put on the endangered species list mm -hmm. by the federal government. And it's, uh, we've talked about this before. It's an extraordinary animal. It's been here for since the time of the dinosaurs. It's been in the Hudson River since there was a Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And in 400 years of European settlement, we have put it on the brink of extinction. Yes. Talk about the protections. Yes. Well, we're, uh, of course, we're very happy about this. It's, it's a bittersweet victory in a way when you have something put on the endangered species list because, you know, to, to get to that point, the species has to be really on the brink of, of uh, irretrievable loss. But, um, you know, the federal government came in, looked at the number of Atlantic sturgeon that were left in the river, and believe it or not, there are less than 1,000 adult Atlantic sturgeon in the Hudson River population. And so this is, even for a large, long-lived fish like this, this is a very, very low number. But um, they're amazing fish in many ways. They can get to be six to eight feet long, hundreds of pounds. Live uh, for they, 70 or 80 years, right? for 70 years. Yeah. They, they look like something out of a Walt Disney, you know, children's horror movie. They look <laughs> like a big dinosaur they fish. They do, yeah. And, uh, you know, they, the female sturgeon have to get to 20 years old before they can even breed and spawn. And so, you know, every time you have a, an adult sturgeon uh, injured or killed in the river, y you lose a big chunk of that population. So. We're very happy about the protections. What this means is that um, the federal government will come in and they will designate certain areas of the river to be critical habitat, so that will restrict activities in these areas. And they will look at activities on the river that are impacting sturgeon. And uh, you know, just right off the top, uh, the Indian Point nuclear power plant is known to kill sturgeon with its cooling system. Uh, this project or proposal to build a new Tappan Zee bridge is of concern to us because that involves a huge dredging and construction project right in the middle of the Hudson River in an area that's used by sturgeon for spawning and, and uh, uh, nursery area for, for young fish. So um, these types of projects have a direct impact on this, on this very threatened species. And so we're looking, obviously we want to close Indian Point down, but we're looking very careful, carefully at a project like the Tappan Zee Bridge uh, to make sure we need to do it and if it needs to be done, to do it carefully. 
You guys have a, a big event coming up shortly. It's the Fisherman's Ball, which is such a great name for an event. Can you tell me what that is? Sure, it's our, uh, it's our annual fundraising gala. It takes place in Chelsea Piers in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, if people are interested in attending, they can find out on our website, um, riverkeeper.org, uh, about the event. But it's a great event. We have usually have a kind of very fun musical entertainment. We have speakers, of course, that come. And we, we honor certain um, individuals or, or companies or organizations for their environmental work of the past year. So it's really our chance to, to look at the work we've done, to celebrate the work that we've done on the Hudson River and in the watershed over the previous year, and to, to inform people about the work we're doing and what we hope to do in the future. So and last exciting. year you honored President Bill Clinton. Who mm -hmm. is the honoree this year? Uh, one of our honorees is um, Participant Media, which is a, a um, film production company which has been uh, making some amazing documentary films about water use around the world and also they also make feature films. So we're honoring them for their work in um, telling people about water issues. Great, terrific. Well, thanks for coming upriver today and uptown for your case. <laughs> and we hope to see you back here sometime soon. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. That's it for this week's show. Thanks to Philip Musagis and Kate Hudson of Riverkeeper. To find out more about Riverkeeper, its events, and how you can volunteer, go to riverkeeper.org. You can also find them on Facebook and Twitter. And remember, all of our shows are now archived on our YouTube channel, and you can find the link on our Facebook page. You can also suggest topics for future shows. For Kingston Now, I'm Jimmy Buff. I'll see you next time.